fathers again we come to your throne with a grateful heart this morning lord we come to say thank you we thank you god for the gift of life this morning we thank you god for clarity of mind we thank you for the use of our limbs dear lord god we just thank you for smiling on us now another day that you have kept us god you kept us all week long you kept us oh god in your safe arms and we say thank you we bless you we honor you we praise we worship you this morning nothing but praise and thanksgiving in our hearts for oh god first of all for who you are and all that you have done and what you're doing now and what you're going to do we just love you we magnify you lord and fathers i come lord i stand before you on behalf of others god you know you your eyes are beholding them the four corners of this earth right now god you never slumber and you never sleep and you are moving by your spirit now and god we say thank you for those that you are touching now for those that you are healing for those that you are delivering for those oh god that you are making a way out of no way that only you can do them god we lift up you up lord hallelujah you know that one right now god that is crying out to you lord you hear the cry oh my god we may not hear it with our natural ears but god you hear them you know where they are you know what they're standing in the need of huh? oh glory thank you god thank you thank you just have your way today have your way in this sanctuary lord have your way in this community god everyone oh god we are nothing without you we are looking to you so we need you lord continually god to hold the reign of our heart to guide and to lead us to direct us in the way that you have us to go we your followers oh god want to follow you oh my god my god we want to do your will we want to do that which you have us to do god lead us and guide us even the more in the name of jesus we ask oh god that you remember everyone everywhere even our young people god remember them in a special way god they don't know hallelujah many don't understand what's happening but god you know and we thank you this morning because you have no respect to person you love them also god you care for them hallelujah and we are lifting them up to you now glory to your name hallelujah we thank you for your word and God we pray now that your word would come forth this morning with power and conviction oh God God we know that it's your word we learn of you through your word dear Lord and oh my God we want to be faithful to your word we want to be faithful oh God to follow the written word as we follow the living word God in the name of Jesus open up our spiritual understanding pour down in us oh God let us know oh God what you the word is saying to us and help us to follow hallelujah help us to follow you as you follow my god your son as you follow your father jesus christ help us to follow you lord in the name of jesus oh god we just love you so much we bless you so much we honor you we worship you we adore you we magnify you hey god is in jesus name we pray we give your name all the glory the praise and the honor all belong to you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Thank God. Amen, amen, and amen. To God be the glory. Amen.
several wisdom teeth pulled on this week, so we're keeping her in our prayers. But nonetheless, I'm here to welcome you into our digital worship experience. If you are a first time visitor here at Grace, we are guided by a purpose statement. We are committed to connecting to all creation with love, compelled to cultivating all those connections with grace, and conditioned to confronting all circumstances with hope. That is who we are, that is who we gather to be as a faith community. It is always our prayer that as we worship together in spirit and in truth, we will encounter God afresh. Let's prepare our hearts, our minds, and our soul for communal and collective worship. God bless you. Praise again. 
amen, amen. Late in the midnight hour, God's going to turn it around. I love when our music ministry comes with a different arrangement because it, it speaks out and it ministers. Sometimes certain things have a way of catching you. And when they begin to repeat, it's going to work, not the whole thing. What's going to work in your favor? It's going to work. And I hope that that's a word for some of us on the day. It's going to work. It's going to work. Whatever it is, it is going to work. That ain't for everybody, but that's for some of us who may be launching out with God into some different places, different realms. It's going to work. And may that be a word for us on today. We give God praise and honor and thanks just for an opportunity to be able to worship again on this Sunday morning. Um, I, I, I'm excited about this word on today, and, and we're going to jump right in. Turn with me to the gospel according to Mark, the eighth chapter, and I want to lift verses 31 through 34. Mark, the eighth chapter, beginning at the 31st verse, and I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples, and said to them, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Let us pray. Oh God, may the words from my mouth and the collective meditations of all of our hearts in this moment be acceptable in your sight. Oh God, for you're indeed our rock, our strength, and our redeemer. And for that, we say thank you. Now, oh God, minister to us, speak to us. Allow your spirit to move within us, oh God so that we are quickened to be more like you, more of who you purpose and created us to be, just to be more in this moment. We love you, O oh God, we thank you. And it's in your name we pray, and we say amen, amen. I, I, I love the Gospel of Mark. I've shared that with you all before, but I just want to read that, that last part. Well, actually beginning from the 33rd verse. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. I want to speak today from the subject, disciples go the distance. Disciples go the distance. We are now in this season of Lent in which we are focused, or should I say more focused, on, on our own humanity, on the dust from which we've come and the dust to which we shall return. We're focused on trying to empty ourselves, to be available to be in, have an encounter, another authentic encounter with God. We're focused on our repentance, of our, our posture of repentance, to recognize, name, own, and embrace those areas in which we know we have fallen short, and to take them before our all-forgiving God. That is what this season is, and this is in this season we, we begin to, to appreciate more as we lead up to the celebration of the, the death and the resurrection of Jesus. In this Lenten season, we find ourselves fasting and, and, and sacrificing, and we're able to gain and garner the strength to do so and to hold out because for us, many of us, there is a set duration. We are, we are making it to Resurrection Sunday. And it is something, a good practice that we fast together, that we pray together, that we sacrifice together, that we abstain together. But 
I want to push us today because while it is easier for us to do that during this season of Lent, where we recognize the sacrifice for a particular time period, I want to push us today because this same posture that we embrace during the season of Lent ought to be our daily posture for our lives. It is difficult sometimes to think about the cost of discipleship. Many of us have been moved and been trained in and, 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 and inundated in the process of membership. We have been uh, uh, understood our belonging and sense of belonging as it relates to our attachment and connectivity to church and church bodies. But Jesus' call is not to membership, it is to fellowship. It is to discipleship. It is to those who are willing to walk the walk in which he walked, not just to, to celebrate his name and, and recognize his accomplishments, but those who are willing, who are daring, who are risky enough to actually follow in his footsteps. Jesus had an expectation of all of those, any who would actually want to follow him. I love Jesus. I love Jesus' teachings. I love Jesus' approach. I can appreciate Jesus' ministry and, and the moments in his ministry that, that stand out, I would imagine, that stood out for him, the moments that were some of the most pivotal and defining moments in his ministry. And here in the Gospel of Mark, we find one of those moments. If you follow Mark's gospel from the beginning to this point, Mark has been laying out a case as to the identity of Jesus. Who is this Jesus? Here in this eighth chapter, which is the, the, the middle of the book, the gospel of Mark, it is a, 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 a hitch, a lynch point, where we see the gospel turning. We see the question beginning to be answered. It is a pivotal moment. It's a hitch for Jesus' ministry. And here in this eighth chapter, we encounter a Jesus who, who does the spectacular and, and, and encountering a hungry crowd. He, he feeds the, the 4,000. And then you had uh, the folks who were still looking for a sign, the, the Pharisees and the leaders. They, they wanted him to justify his identity, justify who those around him were claiming him to be. And, and Jesus said, man, man, woe to you, y'all generation. Y'all won't get a sign because y'all are looking for the right Wrong things for the wrong reason. Jesus said, I did not come to entertain, but I came to actually reclaim those who God has already called, already adopted, but whose eyes have been closed to the nearness of God in their presence. Jesus, he told those Pharisees, y'all won't see a sign. And then right after that, he says he got on a boat went across the shore and, and he encountered and said, the, they, the people, they brought him a blind man, a man who could not see. And, and Jesus, instead of performing the sign in front of their presence, it says that he took the man into the wilderness, he took him in, into the woods, and, and, and he, then he took his saliva, spat in his eyes, touched his eyes, and he said, the man, he, he asked him, can you see? The man looked and said, well, I can see, I can see figures that look like humans, but they're not clear. And then it says Jesus touched his eyes again, and, and, and the man told the man to look up, and the man says, yes, I can see clearly. And that, that signifies where Jesus was in his ministry. He had been walking with people and, and being with people, teaching people, showing people the power of God that was now present among them, and yet they still could not see clearly who he was. Even those who were closest to him could not understand in fullness who he was. They could not see or recognize everything that he embodied in their presence. This is what this blind man represented. And Jesus, he told the man, he said, look, don't go back to the town. Go home. Because the town folks, all they want is to see a sign. But I am here about much more than just entertaining some folks. I need people to get the message of my ministry. And even after that, it says that he encounters his disciples and he asks them, he says, who, who do people say that I am? And they tell him, one of the prophets, Elijah, and then Jesus asked that quintessential question, 
Who do you, you who've been with me, you who've walked with me, you who've seen the signs and the wonders, you who've seen the power of God demonstrated in my hands, you who have understood my identity more than anybody else, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Messiah. Jesus said, man, flesh and blood could not have re revealed that to you, right? Don't tell nobody else because I, I don't need y'all to tell a story that y'all don't fully understand. Yes, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you. Yes, that was a divine revelation. But I don't need you to go tell somebody because you don't even understand fully what it really means. And here to that point, we pick up our text. In that 31st verse, it says, Jesus began to teach his disciples. And he began to share with them that that he must undergo suffering, that he must be rejected by the priests, by the chief priests, and, and be rejected by the elders, and be rejected by the scribes, and, and that he must die, but also that he will rise again. And, and in hearing that from Jesus, that was not the message that the disciples wanted to hear. That was not the message that they thought that his ministry was building towards because if your ultimate hope and desire is that the Roman Empire would be toppled, that the people of Israel would be released from the oppression, that there would be truly the year of Jubilee, that God would finally set the captives free, if that's what you've been hoping for in internally, and now you've been able to walk with someone who possesses the power of God, who has demonstrated signs and wonders and miracles, someone who has done things that has not been done before, someone who has possessed the authority to speak and things happen, the power to touch and people are healed and made whole. When you have been walking with that person, you're thinking that now is the time of God's salvation. Now is the time when God will make it right according to our human understanding. And so when Jesus begins to tell about what his fate would be, Peter, Peter, he does the responsible thing. He pulls Jesus to the side because he did not want to publicly uh, try to correct the teacher. It says that he pulls him to the side and he begins to rebuke Jesus. And we don't get clearly what Peter said, but, but I can only imagine the rebuke of Jesus would have been something like, Jesus, you don't need to speak that way because that can't happen. That's not who you are. You are the Messiah. You are the one that will take the throne of Israel. You are the one that will set things straight. Peter began to try, I would imagine, to correct Jesus in his own declaration about his identity and his purpose and his understanding of his earthly ministry. But Peter said, no, I need to correct you because everything that you've shown us, everything that we've seen, there is no way that it can lead to what you're saying. And in that moment, we see something of Jesus that I want us to really take in on today. It says, and I want to read, it says, after Peter pulled him to the side and rebuked him, it says, Jesus, but turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. Now, I want to look at that because oftentimes what I've learned and what I am learning is that in our human experience, we personalize way too many things. I love that we catch this glimpse of Jesus that shows us that rather than respond directly to Peter, when Peter was speaking out of a sincere but very human heart, that Jesus turns away from Peter and looks at his disciples and rebukes Peter and says, get behind me, Satan, because you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He turns from Peter and then looks at his disciples and rebukes Peter by saying, get 
behind me, Satan. Jesus connects the words of Peter with that of the adversary because it is coming against his understood purpose and the plan that God had for his life. He heard the words of Peter, but he connected that with an adversarial tone, and he says, get behind me, Satan. But he doesn't look at Peter when he says it. He rebukes him by looking at the disciples, which helps Peter to know it ain't personal, Peter. I'm not directly saying to you, but right now you're not speaking that which has been divinely given. Just before when you declared my purpose and my identity as the Messiah, that was something that the divine has given unto you. But now you're speaking according to the flesh and your flesh is identified with Hasetan, the adversary. See, Jesus was able to distinguish it ain't personal, Peter. I'm not, I'm not attacking you personally. I don't need you to interpret this personally, but I need you to understand that where I am going, the mission and the ministry that my Father has given me, anything that operates opposite of that, according that's attached to your human flesh, that is the mark of the adversary. And I have no room for that. Get behind me, Satan. And I want us to get this on today because we have talked about Ha Satan, the enemy, the adversary, the devil, in so many ways that, that it, it has become a caricature that, that we understand as this thing here and there, this, this red pointy horn thing. No! Here Jesus talking to one of his closest followers. Jesus identifies that the words of Peter are connected and identified as Ha Satan. The adversary. See, when we talk about the enemy, the adversary, Satan, it is something to be understood in this text. It is identified by Peter setting his mind not on the divine, but on human things. That means that in all of his good faith, when Peter tried to rebuke Jesus based on his human, limited human understanding and connection and, and hope as to what Jesus would do in the earthly realm, Peter was not speaking of a divine or from a divine place. Peter was speaking out of his own selfishness, out of his own understanding, out of his own personal hope. And because of that, Jesus identified that is the work of the adversary. No. Oh. When you want to talk about the enemies in our lives, we don't need some creature to focus on. Anytime that we operate connected solely to our human understanding, we are not operating in the divine. And anything opposite of the divine is the adversary. That's why we are called to be in this world, but not of this world. That's why we are called to be spiritual beings. That's why we are called to have a renewed mind. That's why we are called to be new wine and old wineskin. That's why we are called to press forward in a way that is connected to our God-given identity, moving and operating in the power of God within us so that the God may be made manifest through us. Jesus looks at Peter. He rebukes him, well, not looks at him. He rebukes Peter as the adversary because he was focused on humanity. My brother, my sister, when we think about being disciples, we must take serious how Jesus lays out what his expectations for disciples really are. This is not the time for us to focus on numbers and members and size and all this surface level posturing that happens in our human earthly realm. That is not the season that we are in here at Grace. But this is the season that if you feel that God has connected you to this ministry for this time, it is not just to be average and it's not just to be ordinary and it's not just to do the mundane. It is because there is something inside of you that God is seeking to ignite and unleash 
in God's kingdom, it is because there is something inside of you that you might not even be aware of even at this moment, but because God who formed you, who shaped you, who fashioned you, understood that he purposed you, and in this season, God is trying to ignite the spark and spark the flame inside of you that will cause you to come out and explode into God's creation. That's you, my brother, my sister, hear what it means to be a disciple. Because it's disciples that actually follow, walk, serve, live, and die accomplishing the will of God for their lives. Jesus says, he called the crowd that was with his disciples. Because, see, there were some movers there were some people who were moving with the crowd of disciples. There were some people who were connected with the, the momentum of what was happening in the ministry. There were people who were attached because they saw things happening. They saw the spectacle and, and Jesus needed to help them understand that, that, yeah, it's okay to be connected. It's okay to be inspired by the spectacle. It's okay to have your curiosity cause you to be with us. But let me help you understand that if you want to be my disciple, any who want to become my followers, you must deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. Jesus helps them to understand what Peter tried to do in rebuking me. Peter was trying to undermine my identity. Jesus said, I have come to terms with who I am. I've come to terms with why I am here. I have come to terms with the purpose that my father has put inside of me. I have come to terms with the outcome of my life. I have come to terms with the duration of my ministry. P Jesus was helping them to understand, I cannot allow Peter to drop words that cause me to entertain anything different because I am persuaded and convinced that this is the will of my father for my life. That's why I had to rebuke the enemy, the adversary, because that was Peter's humanity. Jesus said, I'm on divine assignment. I don't have time for human thinking. I don't have time for human desires. I don't have time for human fears. I don't have time for human insecurities. I'm on a mission that my father has put before me. And if my divine father has given me a divine assignment that is by the divine power of God in my life, that that will come to pass. I cannot entertain adversary of human limitations. I don't know who else is out there this morning that needs to hear that, that if you are on the divine assignment in this season, make sure you're able to identify where those human limitations are trying to be spoken into your life, are raising up from your insecurities, raising up from your past hurts, and you need to declare just as Jesus did, get thee behind me, adversary, because I'm on divine assignment. And in order for me to make it, I have to be a disciple to actually go the distance. And the distance is shaped by the one that I follow. I must be willing now to pick up my cross and follow him. I must be willing now to daily entertain that where God leads me, I don't care where I end up, but I'm willing to go. I don't care the hell I got to go through, but I'm willing to go. I don't care the heartache I got to endure, but I'm willing to go. I don't care how much loss I must encounter on the way, but I am willing to go the distance because I will be a disciple, a follower of Jesus the Christ. My brother, my sister, wherever you are in this journey, it starts with a decision you must decide that you really want to go to distance. Because if not, then church might just be enough for you. If not, then it might be enough for you to, to offer empty words. It, it might be enough for you to, to have the trappings of tradition. It might just be enough for you to carry an empty title. But if you declare in your heart and soul today that you want to go the distance, you must then, you must be a disciple. 
That's why we offer discipleship. Discipleship ain't easy. Discipleship comes with sacrifice. Discipleship comes with heartache and headache. Discipleship comes with carrying a, a heavy burden. Discipleship comes with separation. Discipleship comes even in the midst of separation. you got to be ready for elevation. And with that elevation, it doesn't mean that everything becomes easy. It means that, that when you've been faithful over a few, God then allows you to become ruler over many. But that ruler is not dictatorship. It is responsibility. So the more you are faithful, then the more responsibility that God allows in your hand. That is what discipleship is. Discipleship. Discipleship is what we are offering as a body and community of faith. There's a song, and I'm going to close with this. I don't know why this song was on my heart. and I had to, to print out the words, but this song is, I'm pressing on the upward way. Some of us know it as, Lord, lift me up. And and that first, that first stanza says, I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. My faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. If you are determined to be a disciple that actually goes the distance, you're going to need the hand and help of the Lord along the way. May that be our consistent prayer in the midst of every storm. Lord, lift me up in the midst of the valley moments. Lord, help me to stand in the midst of the chaos surrounding your life. Lord, plant my feet on solid ground. As long as your feet are planted by God, you ain't got to worry about the atmospheric conditions. You ain't got to worry about the arrows that come your way. You ain't got to worry about the midnight hours because if your feet are planted by God and you are rooted in discipleship, you can trust that the same God that walked with Jesus, the same God that went with Jesus in the tomb, the same God that resurrected Jesus is the same God. Same God, same God that is available to you and I. Beloved, let us be disciples that actually live to go the distance. If you are hearing that call to discipleship today, my brother, my sister, take it serious. If your heart is being convicted right now, take it serious. You don't have to figure out anything else. All of that is part of the journey. But if you are making a declaration today, if you've been in church, if you know about God, if you have been introduced to religion, but today, being honest with yourself, this is a call where God is saying, I want something more. I want more. I'm going to work it out, but I want more. I want more of you. If that's you, say yes today. Say yes to the journey of discipleship. Let us pray together. God, we ask right now that you forgive us. God, we ask that you hear us, oh God. God, we are praying right now for how you're moving in hearts and souls and minds, oh God. God, where you at work, help us to see you, hear you, feel you, oh God. Help us to respond right now, oh God, for those who are wavering, those who are trying to discern, is it you calling them to something more? For those who are weighing the cause, who are deciding right now that they have too much going on, too much going for themselves, too much to sacrifice. God, in this moment, may your spirit win out, oh God. May they hear you and feel you in a way that elicits the response, I yield. God, I want to pick up my cross. I want to deny myself. I want to follow you. God, we pray for strength. We pray, oh God, that they have the perseverance. We pray for courage, oh God. We pray for your spirit, your wisdom, your guidance, your discernment. God, we thank you for how you're moving. We thank you for how you're shaping. We thank you for what is to come. We thank you for the impact that will be made in your kingdom. We thank you that people will begin to see you in new ways. We thank you for all of the signs and miracles and wonders that you shall bring to pass. We thank you for manifesting your will in ways that we can't even understand. We thank you, oh God. In 
we give you all glory, all honor, and all praise for it. It's in your holy and precious name we pray. And we say amen. Amen. Listen, we invite you not only to discipleship, but we invite you to be a part of this community. If God has aligned you with this ministry, then come and be a part. Be a full part. Reach out. Connect. Help us to know where you are so we'll know how to meet you along the journey and walk with you. None of us have this thing all figured out, but we are determined to be a community with those that God sent to be a part of this flock. As members and committed community members of this part of God's kingdom, we take serious what it means to sacrifice together. We believe in the call, the work, the assignments, the divine assignments that God has given to us. And we are faithful. We try our best to be as faithful as possible to those assignments. And we know that we only are able to do that when we come together and share together. That's why we sacrifice. Whatever you have to render, sacrifice with us. It's not about an amount. It's about us being equal in the act of sacrificing. Whatever you have, let us give thanks for it. God, we thank you for these, your tithes and our offerings of sacrifice and love. God, may you receive them, bless them, multiply them, that we might continue to use them for the work that you have put to our hands. Help us to be good and faithful stewards over everything you so graciously give unto us. It's in your name we pray and we say amen, amen, amen. We praise God for having you worship with us on this Sunday. It's our prayer that something transpired to bring you closer to God in your walk as an individual, but also that we might be more empowered as a community. Now let us sing our closing song, Praise God From Whom All Blessings Flow. forever bless and always keep us may he always raise his countenance and allow his face to forever shine upon us may that same God continue to remind us to live boldly to faith forward and to always love unconditionally from now until we meet again on the other side where the sun neither rises nor sets for the sun is Jesus the Christ who's in the light of the world it's in his name that we pray let all of God's children say Amen.